And welcome everybody. Welcome to our webinar, Tai Chi and Exercise Program Design for Improving Balance and Preventing Falls. I'm Diane Bailey. I'm the creator of the Open the Door to Tai Chi system. And with me today, I have Dr. Christian Thompson. He's an associate professor at the University of San Francisco, and he's the owner of Thompson Fitness Solutions. Part of the reason, as I was just explaining, that I really wanted Dr. Thompson to come on today is because he's an expert in researching balance and making sure that all the pieces come into play with exercise programming so that we can help our clients reduce their risk of falling. This is a critical piece of what we all do. You know that I am a Tai Chi expert. I am convinced, and the research <laughs> backs me up, that Tai Chi is a very important piece of that puzzle, that it is exceptional for improving balance. But I wanna make sure that you have all of the pieces, that it's not just Tai Chi, because the bottom line is that we wanna help our clients in any way that we can. So Dr. Thompson, I'm gonna let you take it from there. I'm gonna let you just um, describe what you're gonna be doing today. Give yourself a little bit more background so that everybody knows you. And I really appreciate you coming on today. Okay, thank you very much, Diane. It is fantastic to be here. Hello, everyone from San Francisco, California. It is beautiful and lovely outside. I even got to wear my flamingo short sleeve shirt. This is, uh, this is a big day for me to get to bust out the flamingos. So I'm excited. I'm really thankful for Diane giving me the time. We've known each other for about a year and a half. We sit on FAI's board together. And um, Diane and her husband did come out to San Francisco to help train the exercise leaders that are part of our humongous, very large community-based program called Always Active. And she taught our 20 plus instructors uh, many different Tai Chi sequences that they could bring into uh, the training programs that we do with older adults all over the city. So it's been great. I see her at conferences regularly and it's really a great opportunity uh, to do this uh, webinar as well. Um, I'm a faculty member at University of San Francisco. I'll talk about that a little bit more. The research that I do since I was a graduate student back in 1993 at University of Oklahoma, then University of Kansas, and finally here at USF, has all been geared toward exercise programming for older adults. And really where it's at now, um, primarily is looking at balance training and fall risk reduction. And that's where I've focused most of my energy over the last 15 years or so. Um, through those research experiences, I've started to distill what I feel are the, really the critical elements that need to be in exercise programs for reducing fall risk, and I wanna share that with you today, give you a little bit of just basic strategy that you can take forward and work with uh, clients that you might have or patients that you might have so that you can start implementing this stuff right away. Also a couple of free resources, again, so you can hit the ground running with some of these exercise solutions as fast as possible. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen with you guys and take you through maybe about a 30 to 40 minute PowerPoint presentation then we'll open up time for some questions, answers, things like that. So I'm heading down to share the screen, say goodbye to the Flamingos for at least a few minutes, um, but they'll be back. All right, and here we go. We're going to PowerPoint presentation, and I'm going to start the slideshow now. Okay, so um, as Diane said, we're gonna be talking about uh, fall prevention exercise programming. We will also touch quite a bit on Tai Chi. I've invited Diane to come on whenever she feels like it would be appropriate and illuminate to a larger degree some of the points that I make about Tai Chi and its efficacy and helping to improve balance and reduce fall risk. Um, and so here we go. All right, first I wanna tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, so outside of my academic work at the university, I also run a consulting business, Thompson Fitness Solutions. And really ultimately the goal is to provide fitness and clinical professionals with lots of different tools that they can use to help their older adults. And we're not just talking low function older adults. When we say fall prevention and balance training, unfortunately, oftentimes we immediately go to thinking about 
that very low function um, older person who has trouble perhaps ambulating without a walker, who has trouble transferring from uh, sitting to standing and things like that. But really, ultimately, the physiological changes that take place with the aging process happen to the full continuum of older adults. Yes, maybe it happens more quickly or more um, easily observed in those people who are low fitness. But if you were to ask even the senior uh, games participants, when we were in Albuquerque for the Functional Aging Summit about a month, month and a half ago, we were there at the same time as the uh, National Senior Games. And I asked a bunch of the athletes that I bumped into, and I just asked them a simple question. You know, do you feel as though you are a balanced, as balanced as you were 10 years ago? And everybody said no. Doesn't matter how uh, well trained they are as an athlete, there are just things that change that cause us to sort of get a little bit off the rails or sense that we're losing our balance capabilities. So all of the training that we talk about with this program, with Diane's program, please, I just wanna emphasize, this is for the masses, all older adults. If we plan our interventions and our strategies to be appropriately challenged, you can make an exercise as tough as, it want, as you can make it and really challenge even the highest level of function older adults. So please look at this as something that should be really delivered to all of your uh, clients and patients. All right, we're gonna go through some objectives. You can read these later. I'll make sure that we have the PDF of this PowerPoint available to all of you. Um, first thing we'll start with is just a little bit of an introduction. The, the point is that, hey, I've been doing this for a long time. This is USF right outside my window right here are the different buildings and the, the uh, Dos Lobos, the two wolves uh, sculpture right out in front of our science building. I've been studying this stuff forever. I first thought I was gonna be working with athletes, but really what it comes down to is working with older adults has so much more um, enjoyment and fulfillment and enrichment in my own life and I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, and what we are talking about, what we'll discuss today is really now proven by research. I had a research study that took place in all of the senior centers that we work in in San Francisco, over 20 senior centers, and we ran an intervention, a balanced training intervention and a fall risk reduction intervention. And back in February of this year, we got uh, published in the Translational Journal of the American College of Sports Medicine. Happy to provide that PDF for people as well, so just let us know if you're interested in reading that. But uh, we know now the science is advancing enough that we sort of know the things that work, and we also know the things that don't work. And now we're trying to figure out the dose, how much we need to train these different systems and these different types of exercises to help to really make the maximal impact on our clients. Let's talk about the falls. Unfortunately, that's my mom. Okay, my mom, uh, back in 2009, we went to Cirque du Soleil down in Orlando, Florida. And after the performance, she was so into it, she decided to try out herself. She tripped over a brick in downtown Disney, which is now Disney Springs, and she ended up with a distal radial um, fracture. And yeah, the wrist isn't supposed to look like that. Very common location of fracture. People put their hand out to stop the fall, and if they land on a surface that's very hard or they have limited bone mineral density, it's gonna lead to a fracture. And almost a third of people over the age of 65 fall every year. I mostly get worried about repeat fallers. Anybody can fall once. But if you start falling two, three, four times in a year, we know that there's something going on that really needs to be addressed. And the statistics for that is about 12%. So about 12% of people over the age of 65 fall multiple times in a year. And those are the folks that it's not just bad luck, something's going on that we need to address. Obviously the numbers from both the, the quality of life and also the, the, the burden and pressure on our uh, medical system is substantial. And we know that as we continue to get older, our population ages, these numbers are probably not gonna get much better unless we do a lot to address the particular problem. Um, even if people kind of make it through a rehabilitation process, the likelihood is that they'll never really get back to that full level of function they were at before their fall. 
So the best thing we can do is try to be preventative and reduce the risk in the first place. Let's talk about some factors. Why are there so many people falling? I mean, my gosh. Um, there's a researcher from Yale, Mary Tanetti. Um, she, back in the 1990s, was kind of like the pioneer in this area and started really researching falls and why they happen and how we can address them. And she came up with over 160 different independent risk factors. There are 160 plus things in our world that can lead to us falling. If you just look around where you are right now, wherever you are, at home, at work, at the gym, whatever, I guarantee a few places in your immediate surroundings is something that might take you down. I've got a power cord plugging into my laptop right now. Definitely the conditions in the room that I'm in could lead potentially to a fall. Um, we get concerned when we also have environmental issues or considerations, which we call extrinsic factors outside of the person, also being integrated with problems within the person. So intrinsic factors, whether it's a history of falling, whether it's medical conditions, as simple as somebody with a bad arthritic knee, that's going to change their gait pattern to a degree, cause them to... Uh, 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 weight bear in a different fashion, probably affect their gait, and that sort of thing, even though it's not necessarily a fall, we immediately think it would cause falls, can increase risk. Medication, somebody has hypertension, very common with older adults. Many, many folks who are over the age, especially with the new guidelines, it's estimated that about 65% of older adults are diagnosed with diagnosable hypertension or have what would be diagnosable hypertension. Oftentimes they're on medications. Those medications cause disorientation when going from sitting to standing or lying down to standing. So medications dealing with various medical conditions older folks might have can also be a problem. Bad nutrition, whether it's very low intake of calcium, which leads to bone, uh, loss of bone mineralization, Maybe it's uh, a lack of protein in the diet, which reduces muscle strength and muscle power and the ability for muscles to move quickly. Maybe it's a reduction in vitamin D in the diet, which also has effect on muscle power and reduces the ability for someone to recover. All sorts of issues are present intrinsically. The ones that we're particularly interested in are the things that we can really do stuff about with our training program, so our functional level. How are their, uh, how's their gait? How's their balance? How's their muscle strength? How's their muscle power? And do they have mobile and stable joints? Those are considerations that we can definitely make an impact on through the right type of exercise programming. So let's consider this, this scenario. Let's say we've got Jim. Jim's an 82-year-old hypertensive diabetic. So he's a guy that unfortunately due to his diabetic condition, he's got a little bit of neuropathy. He can't feel uh, his lower extremity and his feet very well, so he won't necessarily know what sort of surface he's walking on oftentimes. He's hypertensive, so he's on some medications that may lead to him having to uh, get a little bit disoriented when he goes from sitting to standing. And he also has BPH. Seen a lot of commercials about BPH. That's benign prostate hypertrophy. That's basically an enlarged prostate. So this guy, unfortunately, needs to get up a bunch of times at night to go to the bathroom. So here we go. There's Jim's bedroom on the left side. There's his bathroom on the right side. Generally, in the middle of the night, the lighting's not really good, and he has to somehow get from point A to point B so he can go to the restroom. Well, let's say also that because he's hypertensive and he's on a medication, it might cause a little bit of foggy head syndrome as he goes from lying down to standing up. He gets that head rush process that lasts for a little bit of time. And he's also got little Fluffy. Fluffy's his dog, and Fluffy leaves that purple bone all over the place at nighttime. It might not happen tonight. It might not happen next week or next month. But at some point with this kind of condition occurring, Jim is going to have problems, and he will, whether it's tripping over Fluffy's toy, or he gets disoriented and trips over the carpet, or just kind of loses his way and bumps into the wall or, or into uh, the nightstand, he is likely to fall because we've got all these risk factors that have built up. So we have to recognize that uh, everyone is a little bit of a, uh, 
a ticking time bomb and we have to try to identify what it is we can do to help reduce that risk as effectively as possible. So now let's talk a bit about what happens physiologically as we age and again, why even the most high, uh, highly fit older adults will tell you that they don't feel as balanced as they did five or 10 years ago. And they can't even put a finger on why, but it is true. So we've got 160 different things that cause us to increase our fall risk. And we only have three measly fall defense systems within our body. And unfortunately, they get worse as we get older. They start to lose just through the biological non-disease, just the biological aging process, certain things change and go downhill a little bit. Vision starts to get worse. Even in the absence of glaucoma or cataracts or macular degeneration, there are changes to the structures of the eye and also the sensitivity of the eye uh, sensory receptors that cause vision to start to get a little bit worse as we get older. Our vestibular system and our inner ear, those fluid-filled um, semicircular canals, those things unfortunately get a little less sensitive so we don't detect sway, what we call postural sway, this motion either medial and lateral or anterior and posterior, we don't detect sway as effectively, and it can lead to us having problems being able to recover when we lose our balance because we don't detect that our balance is lost until it's perhaps too late or causes us to really have to have a big stumble and a big compensatory move to, to recover. That's not even mentioning things like vertigo where there's serious abnormality within that structure and we have a sense of dizziness and disorientation that literally feels like your head is spinning. That's a bad situation and happens oftentimes with older adults as well. Then finally, we have the surface of our feet, our somatosensory system. That's where we have all these sensory uh, nerve endings that integrate ultimately up to the brain and let the brain know what sort of surface we're walking on, what sort of, um, uh, of sensation is being transmitted from uh, the contact with the ground up into our body so we can anticipate if it's a slippery surface or a bumpy surface or a firm surface. And those sensory receptors, unfortunately, as we get older, they become a little desensitized as well because most of them get turned on and turned off with motion within a joint. So if your feet aren't as flexible or your ankle or your hip is not as flexible as it was when you were younger, we're getting less of those sensory receptors turned on and therefore less input coming up to the brain. This is a classic sensory motor integration issue. Less info in, less information for the brain to process, and more than likely a less effective or efficient movement or motor program comes from the brain to help us through that particular situation. So these are the sorts of things that are changing and aging, even in absence of disease, and even in our high-performing older adults, that give them the sense that things just aren't quite the same, aren't quite the way they used to be, and gives them a little bit of that sense of, of being a bit unnerved in certain situations. Let's talk about the muscular system. So muscle mass is super important. We know as we get older, muscle mass begins to decrease and less. We're stimulating their neuromuscular system, ensuring that we're still pushing the body to uh, be exposed to resistance and, and load so we can maintain muscle mass. If somebody loses muscle mass to the point that they are two standard deviations below the younger adult cross-sectional area of muscle, they've got what's called sarcopenia. That is a lack of muscle mass to the point that essentially they're going to be at risk for losing their independence because they can't get out of bed, can't get out of a chair, can't cross a crosswalk fast enough, and they really start having trouble living independently. Um, generally though, even if muscle mass drops, muscle performance sometimes isn't necessarily gonna be affected as much. This relationship between amount of muscle mass, quality of muscle mass, and muscle performance gets a little hazier with age. So even if you see somebody who seems to have a good amount of muscle mass, their legs still seem very strong, or they seem pretty big, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are in a very good neuromuscular performance situation. 
they might have poor muscle quality, and they might have a difficult time recruiting the musculature in the legs as well. So we need to ensure that our training programs keep stimulating the muscles, particularly of the lower extremity, both from a strength and from a speed or what we call power perspective. That's really important as well. So we have motor units up in our brain, our motor cortex, okay? That includes all of the neurons that innervate all of our skeletal muscles. The big ones that like create fast motion are our type two or fast twitch motor units. So we've got neurons up in our brain that are type two neurons that inter innervate some of our muscles. We also have type one neurons, which are more of our endurance muscle fibers and endurance neurons that innervate our type one muscle fibers. The problem is as we get older, we start preferentially losing the type two. And those are the ones that help us move fast. And if you think about recovering from a trip or a stumble, if you can't turn on the type two neurons, you're not going to turn on the type two muscle fibers and you won't be able to move fast enough to stop that trip or stumble. So unfortunately, we start seeing a loss of muscle power or, or speed of movement with aging as well. So our neuromuscular system takes quite a beating as we get older, unless we program and exercise the right way, the appropriate way to maintain that function as best we can. Additionally, gait changes quite a bit. So the gait cycle includes a stance phase where a foot is in contact with the ground. We are essentially in a single leg balance stage at that point, so stance. And then also the swing phase where the foot is swinging through in an open chain uh, manner, swinging through space, getting ready for the next stance position. We generally have about a 60-40 relationship with stance and swing. So we have a foot on the floor about 60% of the time, and then it's swinging about 40% of the time. As we get older, there are a lot of things that occur that cause gait to change. So we need mobility of the ankle and the hip. If the ankle and the hip start to get less mobile, we decrease the ability for the leg to swing, so we start adopting a little bit of a shuffling gait, which in and of itself is bad because you can trip over something really, really like basically low to the ground if you're shuffling along. And we lose that swing capability. We're not able to coordinate our uh, upper body rotational motion with the swing phase of the leg. So oftentimes we notice when we see somebody shuffling their feet, they're not really swinging the arms as they move because they've lost this upper and lower body coordination of movement. So stride length gets shorter, gait velocity gets shorter, they spend more time in stance, they walk with a wider stance, which seems safer, but really when it comes down to it, all these biomechanical alterations in gait lead to an increase in fall risk. So we need, again, to integrate some gait training into our exercise solutions. All right, so this is all bad news so far, right? We've got 160 different ways to fall. We got three balance control systems that go haywire. Our muscular system doesn't work so well. Our walking isn't so good. There's a lot of bad stuff. So it's time to talk about the solutions, right? And it's really great. Many of these things that we discussed today um, are integrated into Diane's programs, Tai Chi, incredibly important and also some other individual-based exercises that you can throw at your clients too. Really, really super effective and fun. Okay, so just briefly gonna talk about a task force report that came out in 2018. Basically, they've studied literally tens of thousands of research participants in different studies, and basically said, if you don't have exercise in a fall risk reduction program, it's not gonna work. You can manage medications as much as you like. You can make sure the eyes and ears are working well. You can make sure there's a grab rail and um, there are uh, adaptive devices all throughout someone's home. But if you don't focus on exercise, it's not going to reduce falls. We need to have exercise. It's the most important component. And looking across all these 15,000 participants in the different research studies, these interventions, really need exercise and will show about an 11% reduction in falls occurrence.
gosh, if that's 11% reduction, think about it, about one third of people over 65 fall every year. If that goes down to 22%, that's literally millions of less falls occurring on a yearly basis. It is incredibly powerful. So we need to ensure that we integrate these strategies into our training programs. There's also some other information about vitamin D, another talk I'd, I'd be happy to share you with uh, information about nutrition as well. Okay, just a couple of things that I'd urge you to make sure you inform your clients about. Obviously, we're here to deliver exercise as um, an intervention uh, that will help to reduce fall risk, but you should also just tell your clients that it's really important that they should probably have somebody come in and check out their home and determine if there are any glaring fall risk uh, issues in the home, such as a lack of adaptive devices or bad lighting. Um, and there's an uh, organization, a nonprofit called Rebuilding Together. They have branches in every county in the United States. And they will come out and do a home hazard assessment and oftentimes even have some funds to help to build out some fall risk reduction uh, um, uh, build outs within a person's home. So uh, rebuilding together, really, really good to advise your clients to go toward medication management, lots of medications either themselves or when they interact with one another can lead to disorientation, confusion, a lack of awareness, and those things can really, really increase fall risk. Advise your clients to either talk to their doctor or better yet, go to a local pharmacy with all of their medications in a brown paper bag. We call them brown paper bag checkups. And just go to the pharmacist and say, look at these medications, am I at risk for falls by taking these? And they'll go to their desk reference and they'll let you know, talk to your doctor about maybe switching this medication, reducing that medication. Most people are over-medicated. When we're over-medicated, it causes a greater risk for falls. So that's a good thing to talk about too. And just make sure that all your clients are very aware that they should be oftentimes having their eyes and also their ears checked. Ears, really important. Hearing has a big impact on falls, also on depression and dementia. If you don't hear well, you're not getting a lot of information in, your brain's just kind of sitting there. We want stimulus, stimuli that your brain will have to attend to. And your hearing is one primary sensory organ where we get stimuli coming into our brain. So having eyes and ears checked, and if possible, also a vestibular system check to ensure that the person isn't likely to have vertigo symptoms, very important as well. Okay, now on to the fun stuff. Essential exercise elements. So there was a study published back in 2011 uh, in the New South Wales Public Health Bulletin by Sherrington. And basically, they're tr we're in the middle of trying to establish the right dosing for exercise as it relates to balance training and fall prevention. You know, you've all heard of the, the dosing for um, general exercise, 150 minutes per week, 75 minutes of vigorous per week, et cetera, that moves the needle on things like blood pressure, et cetera but we really don't have specific recommendations yet for balance training and fall risk reduction. But we're moving in that direction. Really what you hear mostly now is make sure you include some balance training in your, in your training programs. And unfortunately, people are like, okay, well, let's just stand on one leg for a while. That does not work, trust me. So we know that there needs to be a regular performance of these types of exercise to really have an impact on falls occurrence. However, within just a couple of weeks, we can reduce the risk for falls by improving functional capacity. So these are things that your clients will really quickly start noticing they're improving with. And maybe they'll come and give you success stories that, you know, I tripped the other day and I thought it was gonna take me down, but for some reason I didn't fall. Those are the wins. That's where you know that their program is working. However, we need to choose the right exercise components. There's been a fair amount of research looking at which types of exercise help to move the needle in fall risk reduction, okay? Not to say that doing cardiovascular exercise is not good. I am somebody who says every older person needs to be a jack of all trades. There's so many different things that could decline, whether it's 
VO2 max and metabolic health, muscle strength and muscle mass, balance, sensory capability. We're on kind of a downward slide with a lot of different things. So if we don't include a bunch of different elements into a person's training program, there's gonna be something that takes that person down. So definitively encourage metabolic training and cardiovascular training. It's gonna keep the mitochondria uh, uh, replenishing. You're gonna keep good aerobic capacity. That's gonna help a person to have energy, et cetera. But training cardiovascularly itself doesn't do much to reduce fall risk. So if you've got somebody who's a big hiker or a big runner or a big skier or a big cyclist, that's great. They've got the cardiovascular element looking good and the metabolic element looking good, but it's not gonna do much to help with balance and fall risk reduction. So you have to convince them we have to add in some other stuff. Yoga and Pilates, really, really good. Great for flexibility, strength, core, et cetera. There haven't been any research studies to indicate that it reduces risk for falls. Static stretching helps to keep good uh, musculoskeletal integrity, but there haven't been any research studies indicating that static stretching does the trick. So here are the things that we definitely have good evidence on. And even though it's at the bottom, I'm gonna talk about it first. Tai Chi, Tai Chi really is a combination of a no almost all of those other exercise elements that I've listed. That's the beautiful thing about Tai Chi. It integrates gait, it integrates static balance, it integrates dynamic balance, it integrates power and strength, it integrates a sensory impact where we're changing directions and moving through open space and turning the head, all of these things that stimulate the sensory systems and you need to have good hip and ankle flexibility and torso flexibility. So joint, all of those are checked off by Tai Chi. Diane, do you want to say anything really quickly about Tai Chi? Well, and uh, thank you, Christian. I appreciate it. It is, and obviously you know the research, Tai Chi has been researched uh, over and over again with, in particular, balance improvement. And it is all of those pieces put together in one form of exercise. That's kind of the fun part of it, is that it is all put together. It's movement balance, and you and I have talked about that, you know, and, it, and you have this aesthetic and dynamic balance, but really, you know, that movement balance, there's very few falls that happen when someone is standing completely still. It's, it's really when they're moving, and that's what Tai Chi is so good about, is you have to learn where your weight is, you understand your posture, you understand keeping your eyes on the horizon, um, all of those pieces are um, part of Tai Chi. The other, um, just real briefly that I, you mentioned that Tai Chi is really good about too, is it's a very approachable, regular exercise. It, you can't just go to one balance class and say, okay, now I'm balanced. But you have to regularly practice it. And that's the beauty of incorporating Tai Chi is it's a fun class to go to. It's a fun exercise that challenges you that you can't just go to one class and say, now I know Tai Chi. You actually have to continually work at it. And that's part of the beauty of it as well. Agreed. Okay, great, great, thanks. Um, okay, so these other elements are all individual elements that we know need to be addressed so that we don't lose function in one of these areas and cause an increase in risk. So let's talk about them a little bit. Um, some of the recommendations you should definitely make, if you have somebody that is coming in for intake and you find out that they're falling a lot, definitely ensure that they've already gotten referred to a physical therapist and physician. Try to get information from those clinicians to help figure out what it is that might be apparent that's leading them to fall. Um, I personally like to use what's called the 75% rule for a lot of our exercise programming. The key is try to ensure that you're making your training challenging enough in these different domains of exercise that the person is going to adapt, right? If we're not overloading the, the persons from a level of, of exercise challenge, we're just going through the motions, they're not gonna benefit. So the 75% rule, really means as they do these different exercises, 
they should, with concentration and working hard, be able to execute it really well about 75% of the time, and 25% of the time, whoa, they're off kilter and wobbly. And it's okay, because if it's only 25% of the time that they're really sort of struggling, we know that that's a good um, level of challenge for learning, for that motor learning to take place. If they're going through the motions and having no trouble, there's just not enough of an overload stimulus. If they're off balance all the time, there's too much sensory stuff coming in, their brain and body won't be able to integrate it. So the 75% rule for challenge is a good one. And if they do get a little wobbly, tell them it's okay. We want a little bit of wobble. That's the brain and the body trying to figure it all out. So that's a key as well. Recognize that these different components, you know, the dynamic and static balance, the gait enhancement, muscle strength, muscle power, sensory stimulation, joint mobility, they all may adapt on different time courses. So we can't just assume that if we progress one, we should progress everything else. We really need an assessment strategy that helps to drive how we progress these different exercise domains, okay? Also, it's probably good to make sure that there's at-home work they can do, and many of these sequences are so easy to do at home or when they're in the line at the grocery store. I have a lot of our older adults making life an exercise. Every opportunity they have, they're doing some kind of a challenge to themselves so that they can just continue to accrue that uh, capability over time. Um, here are some recommendations. Again, we do not have specific sets, reps, time durations yet set up for uh, fall prevention and balance training as of yet. There's just not enough data to really provide a white paper gold standard recommendation like there is for other things like muscle strength and cardiovascular fitness. Here's what we do and we've had a lot of success with. I definitely recommend using time-based rather than repetition-based. Time-based really, really helps with things like our static, our dynamic, and our gait, and our sensory stimulation work, also our joint mobility work. So just try to ensure you're getting enough time. And the great thing about sets that last 45 to 60 seconds, these fit beautifully into your own training programs with your clients. Let's say you're doing a strength training session between sets of say maybe a TRX lunge or a TRX squat or a kettlebell exercise. During our recovery periods, might be 45 seconds or a minute long, start plugging in these balance training uh, exercises. They work beautifully, they integrate beautifully with a person's training program that may focus on something else and now we have a tapestry that jack of all trades sort of training session where the person is getting doses of everything to help improve their function globally. So they work beautifully in that kind of a setting as well. If not, just back to back to back in its own balance training program. Really, really important, we gotta meet people where they are at. Recognize that because there are all these different systems that play a role in balance, and because there are all these different domains of function that we know we need to improve to improve balance, not everybody is gonna be in the same place. Here we have a couple of photos of people at Aquatic Park Senior Center here in San Francisco, the site of one of our, uh, one of our fall prevention programs. And Harry over on the left side of the screen, he's doing a simple gait training, a, a gait enhancement exercise, tracing the finger along the wall to keep his balance, He's doing just a linear sagittal plane pattern, which is pretty easy, but for him, it's challenging. It's at that 75% rule. Meanwhile, on the right side of the screen, Judy and Virginia are going through a walking through open space with an eye shifting exercise. We've got both gait and a sensory stimulation exercise happening at once because they have been deemed to be and assessed to be at a higher level of function than Harry. So we try to make sure that we meet people where they are and ensure that we're giving them that 75% challenge that's gonna to lead to the most optimal adaptation. Do not just give them the same package thing because it's not gonna help each individual person as much as it could if it were customized.
And I just wanted to add real briefly, um, Dr. Thompson, this is why we're having this discussion right now, is we want to meet people where they are. And there are different tools for different people. Sometimes it might be that they're more interested in just a balanced class, or they, their doctor may have said, I want you to find a Tai Chi class. So these are different tools for us to be using to helping our clients so that we meet them where they are. So I, I just love that. Yeah, yeah, I agree, Diane, thanks. Um, okay, so a couple of things. We're gonna go into uh, some assessment and also program design sequences in a moment, but really what we're looking for is what's called the flow channel, okay? This is straight out of sports psychology, and we want people to be always at a level of challenge that fits their current skill level. If they're highly skilled and we're giving them low challenge, they're gonna be bored, right? It's gonna be a boring program, they won't come back or they won't benefit. If they're low skilled, we give them too much challenge, it's gonna create anxiety. We want our programming to be within that flow channel and then move them progressively to higher levels of challenge as their skill improves. The best way to improve their skill is by giving them the appropriate dose and the appropriate level of challenge with the exercise stimulus. So keep them in that flow channel and have a strategy to find where that flow channel is, okay? So I'm gonna tell you real briefly, we've got an online program called Mobility Matters. We basically have an assessment and then a customized training program for each individual older adult, from the highest to the lowest level of function. We call it precision fitness. It's an N of one approach. Because balance training is so complex, we want to ensure that we customize it and really drill down to each individual's client's strengths and weaknesses. You can see that we've got a website, mobilitymatters.fit. I'm going to, when we follow up with this, I will be extending through an email that Diane sends everybody on this webinar who watches this webinar, a, essentially a free opportunity to experience Mobility Matters. And it's a great way to ensure that you're customizing your training programs in all of these different areas to be the correct level of challenge so that we get optimal adaptation. Additionally, I have some pre-packaged video sequences. We have balance and gait sequences. We have joint mobility sequences. We have sensory stimulation sequences all packaged together in about a four to seven exercise sequence that literally you can just learn and plug and play with your clients. You don't have to go through a long assessment. You can just say, okay, here's a great sequence for us to do to stimulate the sensory system or to focus on an upper body and a lower body static balance exercise sequence. Um, I'm going to allow all of you to have the entire beginner's sequence. So that will give you warm up and cool down, sensory stimulation, muscle performance, and balance and gait videos. I'm going to share that with you guys through the follow up email with Diane. And if you like it and you think that that could be beneficial, I'll give you a discount code. It'll be like 30 bucks for you to go and have access to all 15 video sequences beginner, intermediate, and advanced. So I want to provide you guys with stuff that you can hit the ground running with and also things that maybe you can work into your practice as you go forward. Okay, so let's talk about assessment and program design. So first of all, any assessment, we don't need to develop new assessments, right? There are hundreds. Everybody's got their assessment. Heck, there's an assessment for golfers, Titleist Performance Institute. There's all sorts of stuff with movement assessment and timed assessments, et cetera. We want to ensure that we are choosing assessments that are both specific to what older adults do and also sensitive to detect strengths and weaknesses among different people. So we need specific and sensitive tests. The three tests that I think are fantastic are the functional reach test, this determines how far somebody can reach forward without losing balance. That quantifies hip, ankle, torso, shoulder mobility. So it's a great assessment to see where somebody is from a joint mobility standpoint. And also because it's a stationary test requiring the stabilization of balance, it's a great static balance assessment. We also have what's called the timed up and go test, walking about uh, three meters, 10, almost 11 feet around the cone, coming back and sitting down in a chair. You observe ambulation. We see how well they walk through open space. 
You see how well they perform a cone turn. You see how well they get up and sit down out of a chair. Fantastic assessment. It quantifies dynamic balance and also their level of gait. So that provides us evidence to how challenging our dynamic and gait enhancement exercises should be. And then we also do the 30 second chair stand test, arms across the chest, 30 seconds standing and sitting. And that is a fantastic assessment for muscle strength and muscle power of the lower extremity of the legs. And then we know based on how the performance is of that assessment, if the person has strong legs, weak legs, powerful legs, or non-powerful legs. And that then codes to the level of challenge and the selection of our muscle strength and power exercises. So these three assessments will help then provide us the nuts and bolts of each individual person's fall reduction and balance training program because it codes to all of the different elements that relate to fall risk that we know have evidence to reducing fall risk. Reach test, I'll actually uh, um, show you this real quick. Just a real quick video of the reach test. I will zoom forward, cannot play media, that's not great. That's too bad, oh, here we go, it's playing media. I don't know why it said it couldn't. This is the reach test. This is an assessment of joint mobility and static balance. This is my father-in-law, by the way. I have here today to help Good demonstrate the reach test. We have a yardstick on the wall directly at shoulder height. What we're gonna have Alex do is stand with his feet shoulder width apart, his left hand at his side. Alex will make a fist with his right hand and lift it up at the height of the ruler. We'll make sure his shoulders are square. Take an initial measurement, 21 inches, and now he'll reach and hold his finish position. 12 and a half inches, stand back up. So that was an eight and a half inch reach. We would then check on the left side as well. Okay. So the reach test helps us determine how well somebody can move their body as they reach through open space. That's really, really important to quantify joint mobility and static balance. These videos, by the way, will totally be, uh, I'll send you the link where I've got those on my YouTube channel. So you can see those, watch them, practice them. Really, really excellent. I've got norms coming up too, which will help you quantify or categorize where your participants are. We then have the walk test, getting up, walking around the cone, really, really good test, used all over the place, and excellent for dynamic balance and gait enhancement. So let's watch Alex do the walk test. When I say go, he's going to stand up, walk as fast as he's comfortable around the cone, come back and sit down. I'm going to time him on the stopwatch to the closest one hundredth of a second. That's it. Alex, let's do this test. I will give you a ready, set, go command. Ready, set, go. Around the cone and come back and have a seat. 8.92 seconds, very good. Nice job, Alex. Then we'd have him go in the other direction to see if turning around the cone in the other direction Maybe he's favoring one side versus another. It's just interesting to see if, they, um, if your participant has some abnormality that they're maybe not even conscious of, but maybe their time's much slower or they stumble as they're going around the cone. So good test both sides. Then obviously the chair stand test, 30 seconds. Again, highly used assessment all over the place. And Let's watch him do Ten. a couple. Very good. And he's going to give me a fist bump at the end. This is always stop. fun. There we go. That's 11 uh, repetitions in 30 seconds. Excellent work. Boom. Good job, Alex. Love that guy. Love that guy. Okay. So those are the three assessments. They are simple to learn. We'll provide you the links to the YouTube video so you can practice them. Literally should take you five minutes to run your client through those three assessments. Then we use the norms associated with those assessments. Again, you will get this PDF, so you'll have these norms. And you can see the reach test, the timed up and go test, the chair stand test. It tells you these norms are based on whether a person is in the 80th, above the 80th, 60th to 80th, 41st to 60th, 21st to 40th, or below the 20th percentile. Gives you that whole range. 
So you can kind of see what people do well, what people don't do well in your program, and then construct the challenge of their training strategies to be consistent with where they fall and recognize not everybody is gonna fall in the same category on all three assessments. They can be sort of all over the place. So this is how we truly customize by making sure that we have assessments in these three different domains of function, which will then code to the different uh, exercise solutions we construct. Recognize that if somebody has a really poor score, they're in the 20th or below, they're gonna get a level one or a regressed exercise. If they're in the uh, 80th or higher percentile, they're gonna be in a level five exercise. So it really provides five different possible levels of challenge, okay? So for example, I'm just gonna show you a couple of static balance exercises. The first one is a level one exercise. This would be if somebody scored under the 20th percentile on the functional reach test. They're going to be doing support. Keep on going. A narrow and stance, rotate, upper body rotation. Or slower, whatever speed's comfortable to you. Keep it up. You're doing great. About halfway there, we'll do this exercise for a. Okay, as you can see, that exercise, the feet are both on the floor next to one another. It's a little challenging because it's a limited base of support. And like Diane said, nobody falls standing there. Static balance, we've got to be moving something. People might be reaching and they lose their balance. They might be rotating and they lose their balance. So this level one exercise gets them comfortable with rotation while in, for them, a challenged balance position. But then if we go to a level five exercise, whoopsie, okay, something just happened, that was weird. All right, sorry folks. Don't know why my PowerPoint just disappeared. That is really right. weird. Can you share your screen again? I will share my screen in just a second. Okay. I think if I share my desktop. I don't know why my PowerPoint went out. That's not good. That's all right. Okay. Well, actually, it's good because we're basically at Q&A time. But trust me, you guys will be able to see the um, construction. I give a... a a case study of Mary, a 76-year-old hiker and gardener, show that she scores in different uh, um, uh, levels of function on the three assessments, and then therefore we have different levels of progression for those different types of exercise that go into her uh, balance training program. And all of this, again, are things that uh, we can help you develop the most customized and appropriate training program for any individual client because the more appropriate it is, the faster they'll progress, the more progress they'll make, and the greater uh, uh, reduction in risk they're going to, to, to um, experience. Okay, That's, so. I, and I, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm um, sorry about the technical issues. That, that's all right. One question that, um, and you can just stop sharing your screen at this point. Oh, gotcha. Um, stop sharing. Uh, Goodbye. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Jim asked, he asked if the, um, those assessments are also age normed, those ranges on the assessments. Right, right. You can find age norms. But ultimately, when it comes to constructing an exercise solution, the whole goal is separating people based on performance rather than by age. I mean, an 80-year-old that performs the timed up and go test in a certain amount of time, even though they might be better than other 80-year-olds, if they're at a very slow pace or a relatively slow pace, they aren't going to be ready for an advanced exercise. They're going to have to start at that level two or level three exercise. So even though there are age norms, in order to place them in the most appropriate exercise solution, it's more score-based and not age-based. Awesome. And this is, as I want, I, Carol had asked earlier about, you know, are we, are we going to do a little bit of Tai Chi in this? What I wanted to present to everyone so that you're understanding too is there are many different approaches for you to help your clients with their balance. 
And again, coming back to that, meet people where they are. We need to have all these tools in our toolbox. So this is part of what it is. Tai Chi can't be the only answer. I mean, I would love to say that, but I know better. <laughs> I, tai Chi is something you should have in your toolbox because again, the research does prove out that it is exceptional at improving balance because it includes all these different pieces. But if we have these different tools, we can approach our clients in ways that will help them in many different ways as well. Not only with um, just difference, uh, novelty of approach, but progression of approach as well. This is an important thing. So, um, yeah, I can add on to that too. I mean, having novel experiences, new exercises, a variety of exercises that might introduce a new challenge or a, a new approach to the same training, the same basic uh, 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 domain of function you're trying to tra train. Variety and novelty is really, really important from a cognitive perspective and also from a physical perspective. The last thing we wanna do with any training program is kind of get to this point where it's constant repetition of the same thing. Right. Because they might get really good at doing that same thing, but there are going to be certain areas where if we don't, you know, also introduce different approaches, they'll go left unturned. And unfortunately, again, those could become the weak links in the chain. I have another question from Martin. He says, I may have missed this, but since falls are going to happen, what about training people to fall in a safer way? Does that fit into your thinking at all? You, you want to answer that one? Yeah, that's kind of tough. We're actually working on a project here in San Francisco with a gymnastics academy. There's a good study that came out from the Dutch last year, and they do, they put up gymnast mats everywhere and basically teach older people how to fall. And being a martial arts person, uh, Diane, a lot of kind of the initial indoctrination into being a martial artist, you spend a lot of time on the ground initially because you're kind of the punching bag. Uh, <laughs> They, they learn, but you have to overcome a lot of just the instinctual move. Like my mom, she put her hand out, boom. She maybe could have found a way to fall a little bit more effectively that took the load off of these smaller joints and put it more distributed across the body. That's not something that we teach at our senior centers because a lot of our senior centers, linoleum floors, at best we have little yoga mats, but we are looking at those things and some other intervention styles. You can find some good recommendations on how to really uh, communicate the fall process and also the getting up off the floor process. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to it, our exercise solutions that we're trying to push are keeping people hopefully from having to draw on either of those skills on a very frequent basis in the first place. Right, and, th and that's where, I, yes, I, I started in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, um, which is basically ground fighting, and yeah, we had to learn how to fall, uh, but that's a very aggressive uh, learning process, and I would much rather focus on prevention than when, especially at the, the moment that we get most of our clients, they're not at a place in their life where an aggressive kind of training um, where they're actually falling is, is going to be good for them. Um, you know, yes, learning how to fall is important, but I think if we can focus on that prevention piece, I think we're doing better for our clients in that. Um, no, we don't throw people around in Tai Chi. <laughs> that's not a piece of Tai Chi. That's, that's a piece of my heritage in my martial arts where, yes, in BJJ, I was throwing people around and they were throwing me around, but um, not in Tai Chi. Um, we, don't, we don't do that. Uh, one of the uh, pieces that I wanted to get back to is you were mentioning at the um, towards the beginning, you were talking about gait and you were talking about the coordination of upper and lower body, the rotational component of gait. This again is something that is uh, included in, inherent in Tai Chi. As we're moving, that rotation is actually an um, underlying principle 
that we focus on. We focus on upper and lower coordination to where you have to be understanding when you're stepping what you're doing, um, coordinating that rotation into what you're doing. So again, Tai Chi is a piece of the puzzle and it incorporates a lot of the different pieces that you're talking about in Mobility Matters in that it, it's, a, it's a, um, a way to approach people that will um, incorporate all those different pieces. But it, on the other hand, it's also nice to have different novel approaches. So I really appreciate, uh, Dr. Thompson, that you're uh, very generous offer to everyone that's here to give them that, that beginning sequence, um, to give them as these resources for them to start to use right away with their clients. So I want everybody to know, we will be sending out an email, we'll be sending out a replay of this webinar, and we'll be sending out the information so that you can um, sign up and get that information from Dr. Thompson, because it's, I, that's the reason I did this webinar, is I want everybody to have these pieces. So um, <laughs> we have one final comment um, from Jim. He says, tell Christian his flamingos are awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, so there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank but you very much. I, I appreciate everyone. It is right at the top of the hour. Again, I want to respect everybody's time. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for um, participating in this and for caring for your clients. I, I appreciate that. Look for those emails. We'll be sending that out, and all our contact information will be on those emails as well. So if you have further questions for Dr. Thompson, his contact information will be on there. And if you have questions about Tai Chi, uh, obviously my contact will be uh, information will be on there as well. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great day. Thank Bye, you. everyone.